All right, so we'll give it another couple minutes. Um, and Zach, on that, I think I may have mentioned that on that slideshow, there's some pictures that may not, you may not intuitively associate them, but there's definitely a selection process that went in there. I'm sure there was. <laughs> I'm sure there was. I, I scrolled through it really quick. I was trying to uh, figure out like which ones of the, the millions of baby goat pictures to choose from. Uh, I chose, I think 19 is what the computer's telling me. So got, got quite a few um, and everything is, is like up and going. So we should be pretty good to go. All right, so uh, my name is Zach. I'm the beer and wine coordinator. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, tonight we have a special wine stay with uh, Kat from Parable Farms and Josh, our uh, what specialty coordinator, I believe is your title, Josh. I'm not 100% sure if it's just cheese master or not, but uh, Josh is our uh, in-house cheesemonger, does a really, really great job uh, sourcing cheeses and likes to work with local folks. Um, if you also picked up the cheese tray tonight, we'll be going over those cheeses and kind of talking about how they're made um, and just some, some fun stuff. There's a new jam in there that Josh just picked up, which is pretty spectacular. Um, and yeah, I think ready to get this show on the road. We've got two wines tonight. Uh, the first is Outer Sounds uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, this guy right here. So if everybody wants to kind of swirl their glasses and cheers, uh, we can get a nice little sip in before we start. And uh, we'll start talking about some wine. So this is the first wine tonight. Outer Sounds. Um, it's imported by a company named Wink, uh, which you might have seen online. They uh, partner with different wineries across the globe, uh, finding like what they think is a really good expression of like what the region provides. Uh, we have three of their wines right now in store, uh, the Outer Sounds being one, one called Folly of the Beast, which is a Pinot Noir from California, and another called Cherries and Rainbows, which is an organic, no sulfur added uh, Cote de Rhone style. Um, so kind of fun wines, moderately priced. Um, for me, this has a really great expression of really tropical, almost like guava and passion fruit uh, compared to other New Zealand, uh, the Sauvignon Blancs that'll be more on the grassy, grapefruity side. A really nice acidity. Um, you can see this uh, text sheet behind that I've shared. Maybe eventually I can actually find it on the computer. And it has, you know, talks about like, where they sourced it from, uh, how high from sea level, um, like what the soil type is. So the alluvial gravel refers to how like kind of loose um, the rocks and soil is so that the vines can really train their roots down and, and find the water. Um, so, you know, great struggling as we've talked about in previous wine stays um, really help uh, like the, the fruit really mature in a really good way. Uh, New Zealand is also known for what's called a really big diurnal shift. So the, how hot it is in the day versus how cold it is at night because um, they're so close to the ocean because it's an island. Uh, so you get the big shift and then the kind of concentrates the sugars and the acidity um, at all at the same time. So really good stuff. Hopefully everybody likes it. Um, the you know, goat's milk cheese and Sauvignon Blanc go really, really well together, which Kat specializes in. And you know, that acidity kind of helps cut through the, the acid and the fats of the, the goat's cheese. So feel free to take a little nibble before we get into the, the nitty gritty. Uh, the second wine that we've got tonight, I'm going over this quite quickly and we will have some time for some Q&A, um, is the Dame Fouette uh, from Longa Rosso from uh, Giribaldi. It's a third generation uh, winemaking family. It's all organically grown. Um, they're in the heart of uh, Barolo. And so they make Barolo, they make Barbaresco, they make some single vineyard or single varietal wines as well. Um, I chose this tonight because I like how like the fall flavors it offers. I think the earthiness of some of the cheeses that we're gonna have tonight and the rustic quality that this wine has it can do really well together. This is also our new kind of uh, palate drop, if you will, that's uh, probably annoyingly right behind Josh, but he's, he should be used to those by now. Um, and this is that guy right there. Um, so as it says, it's mainly Nebbiolo, uh, and then there's Dolcetto Barbera and Pinot Noir blended all from their uh, properties. 
as you see in, in Rodello, which is also kind of next to La Mora, which is the heart of all of these great Piedmontese Italian wines. So I know that was kind of whirlwind, but uh, I want to give Kat as much time um, as possible. So Kat, if you would like to talk about your cheeses and what you do, I'll uh, start sharing some of the cute baby goat pictures. We can do that. Although certainly there's the rainbows and baby goats <clears throat> imaginary version of what we do. And then there's the, yes, cute little hope and happiness. Well, actually it's happiness on the left and hope on the right. <clears throat> um, and I like to think that, you know, where you've got hope, happiness is not far behind, something <laughs> along those lines. <laughs> um, and you see them nestled in a school bus because we actually use school buses as portable housing for a very long time on our farm. And we're kind of winding that down a bit. Um, a bit about who we are and what we do. So we're based in Northern Durham and we are a 94 acre pasture-based goat dairy. Um, and so we rotationally graze our goats, meaning we move them to fresh pasture pretty much weekly um, until we get into winter, at which point they spend more time in the barn because the grass isn't growing as much. Um, and we also have a really strict humane certification called Animal Welfare Approved. And they have a lot of, um, well, 26 pages single spaced of details um, of humane husbandry standards. And they audit us for those about every 10 or 11 months. So um, we're about to do our first, um, what did, how did they, they didn't call it a virtual audit. Um, they had a different term for it, but um, something that is going to be more distance based. So I haven't yet seen the directions for how they're going to do that. I'm going to be interested to see, are they going to have us walk around the farm and show them things on our rickety internet? Who knows? Um, but usually it's in person. Um, and one of the other, yeah, you know, I was talking about, you know, people think it's sort of rainbows and baby goats and what we actually live is a business that much of the year is going from about five or 5.30 in the morning on cheese making days until about 10 or 10.30 at night with the end of our PM milking seven days a week. Um, and we're making cheese a lot of those days. So it's um, it's got a lot of routine in it. And yet whenever you have goats, you're pretty much guaranteed to not have routine. Um, Yes, yeah, so and that's an example of baby goats in our bathroom because um, we use our bathroom as the infirmary and you see some mason jars in the back right, which is not moonshine, um, <laughs> <laughs> although there might be wishes for that. We actually use essentially bottles of hot water when we've got a hypothermia situation, which sometimes happens with brand new kids um, who are still a little damp in, in when they've been born in really cold weather. Um, so these triplets were brought inside for um, for a little warm up for a couple of days before they headed back outside. And sometimes we would also have them in the bathroom infirmary. Um, if for example, they're having trouble standing early on um, because if they can't stand, they can't nurse. And I always you know, say goats are prey species and you know, they're also a herd animal and that winds up driving a lot of behavior. So um, that's why we see very few goats giving birth at night because if you think about it, giving birth is like a temporary disability. And um, if you're a prey species and predators are most active at night, it's just not a great survival strategy. Um, you know, to have your kids born then. So usually they're giving birth early in the morning and the kids have all day to kind of figure out the standing and nursing thing. Um, we almost never have to deal with kids born at night, thankfully. And this is just a classic picture of like our south pasture on our farm as the sun is coming up uh, with the goat ladies all out grazing. Um, and to me, it's one of the reasons why even though um, you know, we very much are immersed in our work. Like, you know, we live on the farm every, like we actually live with some of our, like one of our employees lives with us 
it's just super immersive. At the same time, you are more immersed in beauty and nature than certainly, you know, a more conventional office-based job is. So, you know, kind of pros and cons. Sometimes the con is wayward teenage goats trying to get in your house from the porch and pooping on the porch. Anyway, um, I feel like I might have diverted slightly from my mandate, Zach, in talking too much about, uh, if you show me pictures of goats, I talk about goats. If you show me pictures of cheese, I talk about cheese, so. (laughs) Do that, I have some pictures of cheese as well. Uh, This is actually one of the cheeses uh, on our uh, cheese plate tonight. Um, So if you wanna talk about that, we can start eating some cheese as well. Sure thing. Um, so that's in, in what we call our aging cave, um, and it's called a cave, not that it actually is a cave for us, but it's um, designed to create the kitchen conditions that are like a cave, um, and so it's got radiant um, ice water running through the wall rather than conventional refrigeration, and we do that not just because we want it to be a certain temperature, but also because if you use regular refrigeration, it's pulling moisture out of the air to cool down the air. And if you have you know, a naked cheese like this in that space aging for four or five or more months, you suddenly have a giant hockey puck at the end of that time if you've been having um, a lower humidity. So I think this picture is kind of fun because you can see all these different batches. And you can also see, Um, A difference between, we have Dirty Girl Reserve, which is the all goat milk ones, and those are the white um, cheeses, or they're white when they first come out of the vat and go into the aging cave that Zach is helpfully highlighting. And then you can see some that are yellow, and those are part goat and part cow milk. Those are the mixed milk Dirty Girl. Um, And I think you guys tend to get the Dirty Girl Reserve, the all goat version. That's right. Um, Josh is very particular about that. He usually says, anything you make, I'll take all of it, but I just want your dirty girl reserve. Um, it's exceptionally anyway. nice. So. Thank you. You're very kind. Um, so dirty girl reserve is a, um, there's so many ways you can sort of slice and dice categories of cheese, which again, Josh could totally nod all over, but it's a natural rind cheese. And so that means that the um, the various molds that are growing on the rind are um, those that exist in the atmosphere on our farm and are really um, a real driver of what you call terroir. So that sense of a taste of place, a taste of the earth in that area. And you know, I feel like our cheeses have a lot of layers of terroir because our goats are, um, you know they're eating what grows on our land, not just pasture, but also a lot of the, what's called woodland browse, things like trees or poison ivy, which they love, or brambles. Um, And so all of those things make the cheeses unique to us. So even, there was a really fun experiment with four cheese makers um, in the Northeast who made the same cheese but all using the different milks that they, is like the same recipe, the same um, aging parameters, but they all used the milk that they specifically use. And it had a natural rind from their particular aging space. And, you know, people were doing a side-by-side comparison. And that's just a really good example of um, how terroir makes cheeses unique to a place. Josh, you might have a better way to explain that. Feel free to jump in because I feel like I'm an expert on our cheeses, but I'm not an expert on all cheeses. That's more your bailiwick. Yeah, I'd agree about, you know, terroir being a a a sense of a taste of place. And, you know, you can certainly see that in other cheeses across, um, across the world. And I think, I think what's exceptionally exciting about your cheeses cat is that that's i don't think there's an like an american cheese maker really doing what you're doing that really has such a unique flavor profile i mean i think you know you know immediately that you've got a product or farm cheese on your plate when you see it and i 
I'm always excited about how bold and ambitious you are with your flavors. You know, I think you really sort of um, think about them a lot and, and develop them a lot so that, you know, everybody, each cheese has its own distinct kind of personality and its own distinct sort of flavor profile. Uh, and I think that's just really exciting as a cheesemonger to be able to kind of go and sort of like talk to you and select the cheeses and 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 all of that and in terms of sort of like uh terroir and other in sort of cheese making you know i guess it'll it changes throughout you know the breeds and uh, the milk types you're making cheeses from and uh you know the, the pasture grazing and and sort of hay dry dry grazing and things like that so there's lots of different ways uh, I guess cheese makers are able to influence the cheeses they make um, by sort of the decisions on their diets and the land they're on. I mean, I think, you know, a good example maybe as the Comte produces in France, uh, while the uh, cows are able to graze on fresh pastures and make Comte and this wonderful sort of like rich fruity wheels of uh, alpine cheeses. And then when the cows come off the pasture and go into the barns and start eating dry hay, you know, and the milk composition changes, they start making another cheese called Mont d'Or uh, from about sort of was it August, I think they start making that with the cheese that's released in November time, you know, and so the kind of the way the land management happens and the way cheese makers decide uh, how they're going to sort of manage those decisions, you can see it in lots of different places. So. That's actually a really good point, which is, you know, what it means to be a goat farmer even varies so much from, from farm to farm. And so much is driven, some by personal values, like we have a really strong values-based component to what we do, but some also by the land that you have access to, the, the particular climate that you live in. Um, so there's just no such thing as a cookie cutter farm. Um, there can be cheeses that are more standardized because, um, the makers standardize the milk by adding, you know, adding cream or adding nonfat dry milk, things like that to equalize out, um, the components. But in terms of, you know, I could be talking to another um, another goat cheese maker, and we would find commonalities, and yet we can have some real and material differences in in how we do things. And that's just kind of fun to me. Um, by the way, this picture of me here, um, you don't usually lay the little kids on their backs, um, but I had been trimming hooves here, and I just sort of slid her in there, and she just got totally comfortable. Um, and conked out and that's not a common picture to find and mm -hmm. again they're not really made to be laying on their backs um, she was just really happy she looks really happy yeah I think what's really great about that little conversation is uh, a, an understanding of all the decisions you make as a as not just a cheesemaker cat but a, a of a farmer right I mean it's this is not just sort of like milk in the vat decisions this is sort of like uh sort of more base sort of earth-like decisions in terms of like how the goats themselves right i mean i think being part of the animal welfare approved system is your like your commitment to that and an understanding of looking after the animals welfare and looking after the land upon which they live on ultimately ends up in the cheese vats right that those those attentions to detail that sort of care you put into those decisions ultimately ends up on our plate, which is what we're eating tonight. And I think that's sometimes a leap. Most people don't often get to see or hear about. They come to the cheese counter and looking for something tasty for snack on and they pick up a cheese, but they don't really necessarily pause to think about how that cheese ended up where it is. And I think these conversations are awesome just to know that I had a conversation with a, a, a potter actually over the weekend uh, and I thought you know the way they make plates and, and and use clay and spin and make you know take things from the earth and make them 
kind of has a sort of similar um, lineage almost to sort of like foods, you know, this is stuff we're bringing out of the ground uh, and making something we can consume with. And I just think that's a really awesome concept and great to be able to know more about. I feel that way too. Um, I also feel a strong sense of stewardship for the land that we have while we have it. Um, and there was, as you were talking, I was, I was kind of reminded of something that I forget to say sometimes, but we're actually a whole bunch of businesses wrapped into one. Like there's some places that just rate, like grow um, grass or other forage and make hay and that's their business. And there's some places that just raise goats um, and they might raise them for meat and that's their business or for dairy and they milk them and they, they're feeding hay that they bought from someplace else and they see their, they sell their milk someplace else. Um, we do that. We raise goats for meat and milk uh, because well, boys have to have a career path too. And um, until this year, agritourism as well. Um, and then you know, we're doing some retail component because we sell at the farmer's market or at our goat festival days. Um, we also work with wholesalers and we also, it's it just, there's so many pieces of this business and we wear so many hats. Um, and from trying to master um, aspects of goat nutrition and what exactly we're planting in our fields to give them best nutrition what I'm how what am I breeding for like I'm I'm deliberately trying to create a breed of goats that I don't find off the rack because in the south we really struggle with parasites so I'm doing all this crossbreeding to kind of build a better hardier goat and it might be at the same time we're building a sweeter goat but I'll just let my pictures speak for themselves anyway it's that's part of what I, why I love it is that I'm never, ever going to be bored. Um, but sometimes there's also the, oh my goodness, if there could only be a little bit less of this, but you can't, ever, there's no pausing dairy. Like if you stop milking the goats, they start cutting back on production and then your business is shot for the year. Um, so it's really, it requires great fortitude of spirit and also a great ability to, you know, cheer and sustain the people who work with us and help sustain us too by the way this picture okay anybody who has two children and tells me that they like both of them equally is lying they may like them both equally over time but this this mom is a classic example she loved this buckling so much and her little doling she was just like eh fine maybe you can nurse from me fine and then meanwhile we've got daffodil in the background totally photo bombing which is not a common good expression anyway sorry it's just whatever you whatever pictures you pop up in front of me are, yeah. i can't help talking this about is, this is totally off topic um, bring it on to, uh, forgive forgive me but if anyone's up to date and watching the new season of The Crown, there's a really great episode in this latest season which touches on just that topic. Ah, which on which kid you like best? Precisely. Excellent. I haven't seen this season yet. I'm going to have to track that down. Bearded Lady. Thank Good. you for the cue. Please play. So. Could I interrupt a minute? Yeah, go Bring ahead. it on. So. Cat and I used to raise orphan sheep 70 some years ago. And our sheep like goats, which is a side question, where the sh mother sheep, I guess is a hue, would not, if she had twins or triplets, would not take care of the second or third one. Our goats will um, almost always take care of all of them. Um, mm -hmm. I think with goats, sometimes if they are not at a strong nutritional status at that point or are somehow depleted, they might conserve their resources and focus them on the most hardy of the kids. Um, but we have had, like, our, we average about 2.65 goats per doe every year. Um, 
and obviously we're not getting 0.65 kids, but I'm just saying that multiple births and sometimes even quads are pretty common for us. And the does, um, our does have been absolutely able mm. to, I, the first time when I was very new to this and um, we had our first doe on the farm who had triplets, I was like, how is she going to keep track of them all? And she was like a drill sergeant. She'd be like, bah, bah, bah. and her kids just totally jumped when she said jump. So um, I don't have experience with sheep. So um, I feel like I would be speaking out of school if I tried to actually make any analogy. Oh, I can sort of only talk about my experience. Thank you. I have sure. a question. Would that be all right? Yeah, of course. So if you are milking the goats to make cheese, how do you make the cheese different? You've got a lot of different kinds of cheese. And I'm wondering yes. what you, how you make them different. So many things. Um, so one of the first choices that we make is whether it's going to, how we're going to coagulate the milk. So Bearded Lady, the one that there's a picture of here is what's called a lactic set cheese, meaning we use almost no rennet to coagulate it. It sets up over about 18 to 24 hours. Um, we add some cultures and a tiny, tiny bit of rennet and it slowly turns into a curd that's a lot like a plain yogurt. Um, and because it's coagulating that way, it's developing more acidity. And so lactic cheeses have more of that bright, almost citrusy flavor as a baseline. And then most hard cheeses and some soft cheeses like a brie or camembert are rennetted cheeses. So they fast forward um, to coagulation using rennet or something that could, we use a microbial rennet, which is considered vegetarian friendly. Um, and because it's, by, it's coagulating without a lot of the acidification, you tend to get a different flavor profile, like grassy or nutty, but um, typically sweeter, not so acidic. Um, and there's a lot of other choices you then make after that, such as um, when do you expel whey and what mechanisms do you use to expel whey and how much whey are you expelling? So the tools that we have to change the character of a cheese, cultures, like the actual ingredients play, I think, typically less of a role than that how and when you expel whey. So with a hard cheese, we're using uh, what we call a harp, which is sort of a frame with wires on it that looks like you could play it like a harp to cut the curd. And the more cuts you have in that, in that vat of curd, the faster the whey comes out. And the faster the whey comes out, um, and then you get the whey away from the curd, the less acidic that cheese will be. And also the faster the whey comes out, typically you're gonna wind up ultimately with a harder cheese. But there's other tools to expel whey and that includes like stirring the curd in the whey, which this is not exactly the case, but kind of like beating the whey out of the curd. Um, there's draining. If when you put curds and whey into a mold, you could be pressing and that gets whey out. Salting eventually also helps expel whey. So does heating. So all those different things, um, what, your, what tools you use play a lot of a role in the ultimate texture. And then there's affinage, which is the tending of the cheese after it comes out of the mold during aging. So- um, the definition of rennet? Um, rennet originally came, it was an enzyme that came from the stomach of a baby ruminant common, commonly you could have veal rennet or or you know calf rennet also called or lamb rennet um or um or kid rennet uh, um and now um we use a sort of lab formulated rennet that's considered vegetarian friendly so it's an enzyme that helps the milk coagulate okay, thank you yeah, rennet basically kind of clips the proteins and the uh, helps the the cur like the actual like the solids of the milk uh, clump together. So like 
little Miss Muffet ate her curds and whey. That's literally what Kat's talking about right now is like the coagulated yogurt-like consistency. And then what she and her team do, turn it into the certain cheeses, um, which, you know, like Reggiano Parmesan is a good example of the beating and cooking of curd to get as much way out of it as possible so that you can let this, you know, very, very precious and very fragile substance, aka milk, last for two, four, five, ten years. Um, so it's, you know, preservation. You know, the, the old wives tale is that somebody put milk into a, a stomach and they rode on their horse and it jostled in the in the stomach and when they poured it out it was chunky uh so like curds and whey so that's kind of where they discovered that uh something was happening with the the rumen uh so that you know fourth fourth stomach um but as kat said now they're using mainly microbial uh, kat is that a an ethical choice or just uh you like the consistency that the microbial offers we played around with a variety of things and um we found like we here, again, so many choices, but we use we could use the microbial rennet in all of our cheeses, and we're just happy enough with it. And it, um, especially if you think of what our brand is with the animal welfare approved component, and you can't find animal welfare approved regular rennet, like it doesn't exist. And so, for many people who care about that and come to us for that reason, um, for the animal welfare approved certification it's a better fit to use a microbial rennet. Sure. And it would be a, like, we would never use the thistle rennet um, because there's just not, goat milk um, really doesn't have a great interest in becoming cheese. Cow's milk is a little more interested in becoming cheese and sheep's milk really, really wants to become cheese. And the, the thistle rennet is a more, a less robust coagulant and we need all the help we can get. So um, this will run, it would be, you know, obviously a vegetarian alternative, but not a fit for us. Yeah, Josh, you carry some thistle cheeses, like uh, Torta de Cesar, right? That's right. I mean, secretly those type of cheeses are my favorite, those thistle rennet to sheep milk cheeses, I think are, are make fantastic cheeses. And yes, I had I don't have it right now, but yeah, the Torta del Casar, that wasn't the case, was a, a thistle rennet to sheep's milk cheese. I think you see them more commonly in, in places like Spain and Portugal. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, Josh, can you like bring in a bunch of Portuguese sheep's milk cheeses like that and give me a heads up when you do? Yeah, I can. I'm, see, I, I do talk to my fellas uh, um, who I get most of my cheese from now up in New York and they, they, they say it's like a regulation nightmare, but the FDA really do not like importing cheeses from Portugal. Like apparently the, the standard of paper trail is way beyond or below the standard the FDA are really hmm. interested in. And so and I think some of them may have been blacklisted. And so it's quite difficult to find genuine, interesting sort of Portuguese cheeses. You can get like Cerro de Estrela, which is nice enough. But I think if you're really looking for those kind of like esoteric kind of thistle reddited sheet milk cheese is a little harder. Um, Which reminds me, the Portuguese goat's milk cheeses are terrible. <laughs> I mean, I went to the Serpa cheese fair a couple of years ago when Dave and I actually managed to get off a farm on a real vacation and I structured every single thing around a cheese festival in Portugal because what would cheesemakers do for holiday but go to a cheese festival and um i mean the sheep's milk cheeses were heavenly and we kept thinking but there's the sheep's milk cheeses are fantastic how can these goat's milk cheeses be so flat and so lifeless and so cardboardy it was tragic anyway i'm sorry i'm gonna get off that soapbox <laughs> um, and i'm going to talk about bearded lady Maybe. um so Bearded Lady is a really great example of how, in this case, affinage um, or the, the care of cheese during aging, affinage makes this cheese. This, there's some cheeses that are really sort of made in the vat, meaning much of their character is developed in the vat, but affinage truly determines how this cheese evolves. And it's kind of a quirky affinage. So we start off after the cheese. This is a cheese that's a lactic set. So you get that bright acidity and it's 
um, drained and then um, ladled into hoops and drained some more over a couple of days on our drain table. Drain table meaning a place in the room that um, the hoops are put on top of a drain plate and then the, the whey flows out of the hoops and we actually collect the whey and pump it back out to a trough for our lady goats who really love it and all the nutrients. Um, anyway, so after it after it's fully formed in its hoop, it's drained and been flipped a few times to even out the shape, um, we remove it from the molds and we salt it. And many, many cheeses are, they don't have salt added during the make process. It's um, applied later, either dry salting or via brine. Um, so this is salted. And then a few days after that, we, um, we rub it down with a mixture of whey and um, Penicillium rocaforti, which is a blue mold. So this cheese is aged in our blue cheese aging space. And it starts up developing this wrinkly texture because of something we do add in the vat called Geotrichum candidum. And it's a mold that's, that produces this sort of characteristic um, brainy texture. Um, and then the, yeah, I don't really, we don't really have something else that has that texture, but the this bearded lady shows that brainy texture really well. And um, that develops because it had a head start because we added it while the milk was still in the vat. Um, so that develops first. And then the blue actually develops on top of everything else um, because it only gets the blue added later on. And most people think of blue cheeses as having a very specific strong character that would, like the internal blues, you know, you might think of a Roquefort or something like that. This is aged in a blue cave, but in every other way departs from most people's expectations of a blue. And I tend to pair this um, as, you know, as Zach has with, you know, a much lighter, brighter wine, not so, not so often with those um, reds or even a port that you would pair a traditional blue with. In fact, you know, Josh, guys feels, it's, it's always nice to hear other people speak in a way that offers me some fresh insights on what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Bearded Lady. Um, I mean, my, my personal favorite product with cheese is uh, this one, uh, Field of Creams. So that's kind of my, my, like, I look forward to it every uh, spring. But um, Bearded Lady has that, just that, like, hint of funky blue earthiness to it. Uh, that that Geo Rind has a, a kind of yeasty quality, uh, which I really like, especially with, like, you know, breads and, like, crackers, just to really kind of show that kind of, like, yeast profile and then just really light and fluffy and creamy all at the same time kind of takes you through a nice little loop of you know it's, it's almost like not dry is the wrong word but like that flaky uh, consistency in the dead center and then like ooey gooey right underneath the rind um i think that honestly both uh, of the wines go really well with it tonight that little bit of kind of dried fruit and, and earth on the red wine i think just really well uh, and then that bright acidity of the Sauvignon Blanc like, really kind of cuts through uh, the, the richness that Bearded Lady has. Yeah and I thought that little conserve I served on the cheese plate that sour cherry pomegranate um, cocoa nibs and orange blossom right. worked oh, really God. well with it. Um, again I guess painting with that you know that kind of pulling in those kind of red wine flavors you may get from you know that kind of pairing but just in sort of conserve chutney form. Um, I think that really worked well. Although it's like almost like acid on acid there, sometimes that works well as a pairing. And I think especially since the bearded lady has that more like citrus brightness, almost like grapefruity lemon notes, you know, bringing in something again, like classically tart, like sour cherry or that kind of flavor notes or, or more bass-like than sort of like the higher notes say of the citrus and I think they kind of blended well together and the, the spices added a little warmth in my opinion which kind of like helped offset the that kind of bluey twang you get that little sort of black peppery piquancy you get from that pellicin and rock forty. So that's just my sort of take on the concept uh pairing. So Zach could I 
I make a comment or a question? Yeah, please. It sounds to me like the terroir is just as important in cheese as it is in wine. Is that right? A hundred percent. And then cats, you know, cat is a, what's considered farmstead. So she's raising the goats, she's milking it from her own herd and then making cheese. So you can really see like, and, and even seasonally, um, how the, how the milk changes, how the cheeses react to the milk changing. And if the, you know, the, the goats are eating poison ivy and grass one day and they milk from that, it'll have a slightly different profile than if the goats are eating, uh, you know, the, the brush and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and also, Kat, do you pasteurize all of your cheeses or just a few of them? Because pasteurization... So they we do pasteurize all of them. Okay. Um, which, but it's pasteurized at such a low temperature. I always say, if you think about it, most food is cooked at at least 300 degrees, but we are pasteurizing at 145 degrees. Okay. So it's super gentle. Um, and it's just enough to get you over that legal threshold for pasteurization. So happy pregnant ladies. All right. Yeah. And there's, so it's, uh, would you consider it like on the edge of thermalized? I haven't ever done thermalization. So, um, you know, I know uh, the, the thermi the thermized process is just a little lower temperature. Um, so that's probably not such an off description. So yeah, and so just very gently treated. Right, yeah, pasteurization basically like kind of kills all of the potential bad bacteria that may or may not be present in the milk. That's, it's a safety thing. Um, and then with cats, like cheese making by adding different cultures, when to, you know, pull the curd, when to like drain it or not, like all of those cheese making decisions really help affect flavors too. Does that answer your question, Lynn? Yes, thank you. I mean, I might go out. Yeah, two, related, say that, uh, two related questions. And Josh, how much of your cheese is at the co-op is locally sourced? And, and Kat, is this a good area to grow goats and cheese and why is that? Josh, you want to go first since it was a question for you first? Yeah, well, I, I, I try and buy cheese from as many of the local cheese makers as I, as I can. And I think we're blessed in North Carolina to have so many great cheesemakers. I think we're kind of like under the radar a little bit of a national scene of how many great cheesemakers are in this state. I think, you know, most of the attention, you know, and Kat may have thoughts on this too, heads up to sort of like Wisconsin, Vermont, California, uh, New York, maybe. So I, I'm, I think we're really lucky that we have so many great cheese. And I believe our state magazine did a little highlight on that recently trying to elevate the um, cheeses in the state, which Kat was a, a participant in. Uh, so I say, uh, you know, I have about five or six cheese makers I buy from locally, you know, so there's like Cat Prodigal Farm. Um, uh, we have Boxcar, uh, Chapel Hill Creamery, Celebrity Dairy, Goat Lady Dairy. You know, um, I sometimes get stuff from the west of the state, like from Looking Glass Creamery. Um, so there's a handful of, you know, I get a little bit of the Ash County stuff, not a huge amount. So, you know, I know there's a, uh, sell a lot of cheeses at the co-op, but I try to source as most, mo most, as many as I can locally, um, from as many of the cheesemakers I can. So there's probably about seven different cheesemakers and I get multiple cheeses from each cheesemaker. So there may be sort of like 21 different local cheeses maybe. And that's just a, a rough, rough off the top of my head, sitting at my living room kind of answer. And you also search a lot of uh, regional cheeses too. So things from uh, Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, like the, it's in the, you know, the Southeast region of, of the world, so. That's right, yeah. I have to say, when Josh took over the, the cheese um, case at the co-op, it was moribund. It was completely, there were like two or three cheeses in the case. It was the most pathetic cheese case. And Josh has created created from that, from nothing, what I feel is the most vibrant cheese case in the triangle, at least, if not more broad than that in the state. He's, he's really just had a very particular vision and to keep all these different cheeses coming. And, you know, he, he's always mixing it up. It's kind of amazing. So 
Um, I, I tend to tout it as a jewel in our backyard. Oh, we really enjoy it. It's wonderful. I think word is slowly getting out. Uh, but thank you, Kat. I mean, you've been such a big supporter of me and the co-op for such a long time, uh, you know, definitely part of our success. There is, uh, so there was another question about, and um, I might ask you to re, um, po to pose the question again, so I don't answer incorrectly. Was it something about um, the ease of raising goats in the South? Yeah, is this a conducive area to raise goats and, and make cheese? Um, well, it is, our farm is in a particularly good location in terms of access to markets and having decent access to housing for people who might wish to work with us because rural housing is often a difficult area or a difficult issue. Um, but um, in many ways, goats um, and sheep too, I think are not best suited for the Southeast and um, goats are really better designed for hot and dry and sandy climates or cold and rocky climates, which help to um, constrain the internal parasites that plague them. And so we spend a lot of mental energy uh, on strategies to kind of reduce the parasite load without um, and yet using, using chemical warmers as little as we can. So that goes right down to our breeding strategies, which are aggressive um, and records-based hybridizing crossbreeding, because when you crossbreed animals, you get better hybrid vigor. And I think I mentioned that earlier that I'm sort of trying to create um, a more a herd of goats that's more resistant to parasites, even when you graze those goats on pasture. Because um, a lot of people who raise goats are not keeping them on pasture. Certainly not, not so much in the Southeast. Kat, Did that I answer the question? Yes, thank you. Could I ask one more? Of course. Um, how many goats do you have on an annual basis and how many workers do you have? Um, both change a lot over the course of the season. So um, we'll be starting next year with about 100 goats um, on the milking front. Some of them will be first time milkers and some of them will be experienced ladies. Um, and we'll expect to have about 175, if not more kids. Some of those ladies will abort. Um, and so that's why that number is not higher when I gave you the 2.65 number of kids. Um, and this year, so normally we would still have at least 100 kids on the farm at this point of the year, maybe more. Um, and this year was different because um, COVID seemed to get everybody's inner homesteader on. And so we've never sold so many baby goats. So that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and so we now have uh, we're down to just a small number of bucklings that we'll sell to another to other farms, and um, I'm sorry, my 17 year old dog is is talking in the background. Okay, um, give him a pet for us. <laughs> I'm not sure why he's talking, but now he's like, "Oh, you're paying attention. You're talking about us, and that's just fine." Um. Anyway, um. Where was I at there? The number of um, people are working for you. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so in spring, um, we're typically, so we usually would have three full-time people in the creamery in spring and summer. And um, about five or six on farm side, some full-time full and some part-time. Um, during that peak time. So we might have nine or 10 people working for us, again, some full and some part-time. And as we head into winter, when we're not milking and we're making less cheese, um, we still make some cheese because we buy, we continue to buy cow milk from another farm. Um, we are down to um, 
to three, well, two robust part-timers, one person doing a little bit of part-time and two full-timers. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left, Kat. Um, um, you wanna talk about our last cheese? I can. Um, and so the last one is, is that the, is that, I don't actually have it in front of me. That's the saxophone. Picture of the blue cheese. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and it, actually, what you see is a picture of the saxophones. Um, Perfect. Out of school. Um, oh. Nope. Segue there, um, and we. Uh, Oh, looks like uh, Kat's uh, internet connection uh, gave us a little flip around. Let's see. So, uh, Josh, uh, I know that you uh, are a big fan of the saxophone. Haw. Um, it, for me, it reminds me of Stilton. Yeah, it's Kat. It's Kat left us. Uh, she did. She's rejoined. Uh, okay. She's not quite. Back, uh, back in. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, if Kat gets back on the uh, call. There yeah. we go. Oh, there we go. It came back in and muted me. Um, I was here and I could hear you, but uh, we sorted that out. Anyway, so it's made using a, a process um, called cheddaring, um, which sort of further develops the acidity of the cheese after it's after the whey has been drained out. Um, and um, why did we start making this cheese this way? Well, um, all of our cow's milk cheese, cheeses were designed to avoid something. So we were trying to avoid a potential defect called late blowing. Um, and that can happen when the cows um, from, whom, from which you source your milk are fed silage silage is a sort of fermented hay um, and it doesn't necessarily create the late blowing problem but it's one of those sneaky things that you just never know when it's going to pop up and we don't have access to a source of all pasture grazed or all hay fed um, cow's milk um, so the farm from which we purchase does feed some silage and to avoid late blowing there's a variety of techniques Late blowing is when there is an organism that's in the silage that actually keeps going past pasteurization. It's not bad for humans, but it does um, suddenly, like four or five months in, you've made this beautiful cheese, you've been tending it for a month, you've loved it, it's beautiful. Um, and then suddenly it starts developing bubbles inside um, because this organism creates this very slow building gas. Um, and so ways that you can help avoid that are having um, internal salting in the cheese and having a cheese that's aged at a lower temperature. And this cheese did both of those things. Yeah, you know, of course we experimented with things and we wanted, you know, when we tasted it, the first batches, you know, we kept tasting month after month, not knowing how long is this gonna take us? And we're like, dang, this is delicious. Um, so, you know, you experiment because, you know, when you're first making a cheese, you have a hypothesis, but you keep making it because it's good when you have a hit. So I love it, the, just the sort of velvety paste on this. And to me, I love it with like, you know, even, even a whiskey sometimes, but it's just so rich. Um, and it's such a fun counterpoint to the other things that we do. Do you inoculate the sacs of a hall with the pelicinin cat, or is that like a uh, naturally that developed in the blue cave? Is a good question. So we add the, the penicillium rocaforti, but only after it's like all the whey has been drained out. And we do that in part because it, as a cheesemaker, having blue in your facility is 
I don't know, it's like having a potential riot on your hands at any given day because blue is just a hooligan of a mold and it wants to get into everything. So that's why we've got a whole aging space that's dedicated to blues. And when we do affinage in the blue cave, we try to schedule that for the end of the day so that people aren't then gonna inadvertently take the blue to visit some of the other cheeses. Um, so anyway, that's why we add the penicillium rocaforti right before we're hooping to try to not have as much blue sloshing around our, our make room. And then we do all this, ex like we're already cleaning fetishists, but then we do extra clean. Like we have a special thing on the to-do list, which is called blue cleaning. Um, just knowing that we want, don't want it to get around and, um, and wreak havoc with the other cheeses. So, but it's fun because you know, the cheese goes into the aging space and you see these brand new ones up front and then you can see where it's starting to bloom in the back with the blue coming in. And then a bit later on, uh, we're going to grab, we use an ice pick, although there's some other tools that people can use for this. And even though you can see some openness in that cheese already, we use the ice pick to sort of stab into the heart of it because the blue can only develop where, where it has access to air. And, um, Sometimes you have aggressions you need to work out and that's a constructive <laughs> place to do it. So then after we, um, after we do the poking, we wrap it in a special foil and um, it doesn't get as much done to it. It's like a, it's a real butt kicker of a cheese to make up front. It may, it's a super long make day. Um, but once you finally get it out of the hoops and the poking has been done and you get it wrapped, it just sort of quietly does its thing getting flipped every so often for a few months um so that's that's a thing that we're grateful for about it those bearded ladies there's some high maintenance little divas but worth it right i think so i mean yeah. i got into goat cheese you know making goat cheeses because i loved those little lactic cheeses and you know, I continue because I have fun with the other things, but. The Saxable Hall Blue has such a nice restraint about it. You know, that sort of cheddary, sort of buttery texture with just that little bit of blue coming through at the end without it just being overwhelming. I think sometimes uh, I'm a little biased. I think Stilton is like the, the blue cheese kind of thing coming, you know, uh, being from the British Isles. Uh, and I think this is a nice kind of sort of nod to that kind of flavor profile. It's just a little bit sort of like uh, grassy and, and sort of pecan without it being completely overpowering. Uh, I feel some of the American made blues are lean more towards high acid, uh, very bright, full bodied blue cheeses. And I, I really like the fact that the Saxbohor is, is a a little bit more restrained and sort of like bashful uh, and also has, I don't know whether you all know, but Kat spent an awful long time redesigning some of her cheese labels and the saxophone horse blues, I think is my favorite of a, of a cow playing the saxophone. I think that's with some sort of blue in a blue style, obviously. So. Thank you for uh, noting the whimsy that we can't resist. <laughs> Although actually I have to jump in and say, you made me think of a couple of other things about why we make the cheeses we make. And you had, I, I think you or Zach had commented that, you know, we make some fairly adventurous cheeses. And yet at the same time, there's a certain level of calculation because the South doesn't really have a cultural history of artisan cheese production or consumption. And so I've always expected that I have to not be too aggressive and have cheeses that are somewhat approachable. And at the same time, I also, you know, there were other cheeses that were making, uh, other makers that were making cheese in this area before we got started. And, you know, I certainly don't want to duplicate anything that they're doing that they're already doing beautifully. You know, we wanted to have our own kind of contributions in this space. So um, Josh, when you note that it's a more restrained blue, that's 
that was a conscious choice. Sort of for that reason. Right, exactly. And I think, you know, um, like I said earlier, the fact that your, your cheeses are so unique and they're so sort of you, and I think your personality shines through them as well. Um, but they're just a joy to kind of have. And I think we're lucky in Durham and the Durham car market for you to be so close to us and have such a good relationship with, with, with the store and ourselves and Zach and everybody. And uh, it's just great. You know, you can sort of see that personality come through in the cheese making. And I just love that you're kind of adventurous. I know there's some, you know, the, you know, we haven't talked on, on it tonight yet, but I know you just celebrated 10 years as, as a, you know, making cheese and you made this special cheese called Milfui, uh, which was what soaked in, wrapped in brandy soaked fig leaves and is mm -hmm. a stunningly beautiful cheese. And I know there's the horn of winter coming soon. So watch out co-op shoppers for that one coming soon with like the black trumpet mushrooms. But, you know, everything just has a nice little sort of like je ne sais quoi about it that I think we would sorely miss if we didn't have it. Play with our food. That's my belief. Are there other questions that people might have? Thank you so much. We certainly are much more educated about cheese. Thank you, Kat and Josh. Well, thank you for jumping in and asking questions. It's always fun. You're welcome, Ed. We had a, a true expert in the house tonight. For sure. I don't know. I always say that I'm an, well, we're all experts in our own experience. Um, you know, people ask me about other cheeses and I feel like I am so much less knowledgeable. Um, I, I can talk a lot about ours and the whys and the wherefores. So it's fun. We've appreciated Great. it. Well, I really appreciate, you know, Josh and Zach for, for hosting us and we love working with them and definitely look for the horn of winter. It's really fun. Yeah. yeah. We'll you let me know when it's ready, Kat, and we'll bring some in. Yes. We'll watch for it. Well, All right. If anybody has any other questions, please uh, feel free to uh, ask them now. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining this special cheese edition of Wines Day. Uh, we've got Wines Day again next week with uh, Beaujolais Nouveau that is officially for sale tomorrow um, as well as another one that's escaping me right now, but it'll be in the same spot on top of Josh's cooler with uh, the cheese plate of the like kind of featured. And then we've got another Meet the Cheesemaker Wines Day in December. So uh, information about all these are, are in the newsletter as well as on the durham.coop slash Wines Day website. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we will see you next Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank Zach. you guys. Thanks, Kat. Have a great we night. appreciate it. Very much, Kat. And thank you all for thank joining. Thank you so much for hosting us. Take care. You Bye. too. Good night.